Hi, I'm Dave Elfring, and I've been a security practitioner for a little over two decades. And later in my career, I found it necessary to manage risk. And so we found the factored analysis of information risk and began implementing that a couple of years ago. Hi, I'm Melissa Hens. I'm a senior information security specialist, and I uh, run a fair program at a mid-sized transportation and company in the Midwest. And today we're going to talk about risk management, specifically focusing on risk triage. Well, let's get started with the session. And let's share a screen. So triage and why does triage matter? And how does triage let you focus on what matters? And I love this quote from Carl Sagan that it's better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, no matter how satisfying and reassuring. You might not think you're delusional, but this is gonna provide you a bit of a reality check in how we manage risk and make sure that we know that our idea of risk lines up with what risk is in reality and how we can get there quickly through using triage and FAIR in tandem. So the first thing I wanna start out with is let, let's all get a common definition for risk because in my discussions with people in different industries and at conferences and even in my own company, we often didn't have a shared definition. So we weren't talking the same language. Um, and so we're gonna devolve that down to a very basic fundamental definition, which is to expose somebody or something to loss or to harm. Ultimately, risk comes down to what you're losing. And executives, when they wanna know what they're losing, generally that comes in the form of money, which is why FAIR is a great opportunity to show a range of risks that can be accurate and defensible and gives the executives an idea of where they need to invest and where they can make the smarter decisions about priorities and resources to achieve the desired outcomes, as Doug Hubbard would say. Right, and what I really love is we included a definition for risk management from Doug Hubbard, and it's about making smarter decisions about priorities and resources to achieve outcomes. And so everything about this triage process is going to be how you do the basic work to lead to the outcomes that we all want from a risk management standpoint. So to start risk analysis, it can seem really overwhelming. And so let's just kind of set the table by using an example uh, that is very well defined. And so Alyssa and I were, were discussing this uh, and decided, you know what, there are people that have been doing this for a while. Yeah, medical personnel have been watching people die in front of them for thousands of years, and they had to come up with a way to make sure that the people who are in the most need, who can be helped, are the ones that get help first, and those who can wait, um, just they, they get to wait in the waiting room. <laughs> so triage is really about being able to elevate those priorities where you can help and nail that, nail that sort of prioritization of your risks and how that can blend in with desired business outcomes. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so the, the, the entire objective here, kind of like medical personnel, is to find those really urgent cases and sort them out. What needs immediate treatment versus rapid attention? And what are the things that you can kind of move to the back burner and in order to not be overwhelmed by the triage and get embroiled in the triage and just have it you you might never get out of triage if you can't learn how to prioritize and sort these so Alyssa, and talk to people about the reality check oh dealing with reality can be very difficult um, but it's something we all have to live with. The first thing to realize when you're going to 
start your, your fair journey and really get into the idea of triaging risks is you need to plan. And to plan, you need to sort of level set with your business executives, your business partners, and your partners within IT that, that risk is a loss and vulnerability does not equal risk. Uh, you, risk vulnerability is a, is a part of your risk. It's a, it's a, it's a weakness, right? Concept, but it's not, it's not the entire, the entire field of your risk. Your risk is what you're losing. Vulnerabilities just play into that. Yeah, and of course, now that we've all level set, and we've got a common definition for risk amongst ourselves. What is the definition for risk for the executives? And at every organization I've ever been a part of, it's money. The risk is to money. It could be to how you make money. It could be fines and judgments. So the ways that you can lose that money, um, there are a lot of them. And some part of this is about establishing that common language and priority with the executives. And like we say here, uh, don't forget that it's money that makes the world go around, well, the business world. And that leads us to show me the money. So we've defined risk. We've established a shared concern with our executives about money and the real work begins. How do we define a revenue model for our business? Because this is how the businesses make money based on a, on a schedule. When we talk about triage and how you get the most out of it from planning ahead and, and thinking ahead about what those priorities might be and how you can get a firm grasp of what the current reality is, loss tables really play into where you can plan and where you can do a lot of prep work to make sure you're getting the most out of triage. Loss tables and getting the accurate data within those loss tables is gonna feed accuracy throughout the rest of your assessments and scenarios. Every scenario you run and every asset you build is gonna be tied to a loss table. And in some cases, those loss tables can cross businesses, um, things along the lines of um, PCI fines or if sensitive data is breached, the cost of that is pretty standard across most industries. But one thing that you're really going to need to nail down and that only people within your business are going to be able to help you with are the revenue loss tables. So anything that has to do with the money that is made specifically by your business, you're going to want to plan ahead and talk with some of your business executives and find out who has that knowledge about revenue when you make money, when you're not making money, and when would be the biggest impact to what could happen to the way you make money. Yeah, and you know, the funny thing about it is as you start trying to find that information out, it, the sources where you get it may not be obvious at the start. So it's a bit of a treasure hunt. And so you may find, for example, that your C-level executives when asked the question, might kind of give you blank stares. They may not, but they might. And it means you have to go find those people. And I think, Alyssa, you, you had to find the right people in the business that actually, you know, could create those spreadsheets. Yeah, when, I, when we started this, um, going to people in accounts payable and accounts receivable seemed like a good starting point, you know, to, to talk to those executives, but they, they actually had no idea of any of those numbers. Um, it ended up being in something that you would never expect, which was customer service. And so going out and talking to the business, that's where you're going to be able to find these little niche areas that maybe aren't where you expect that will actually be able to flesh out your analyses and scenarios and the data that, that supports those analysis and scenarios. They are not always where you're going to expect to find them, but in order to find them, you have to be out there engaging with your business partners. And I think the really cool part about it is uh, you do start to build a rapport with the business. And I think it's really essential to sell this as something that helps the business. And as you can see from the graphic, a basic Venn diagram, we kind of classified this as the place where risk analysis and business process overlap. Uh, and we have a shared common interest in the outcome of this, of the creation of these loss tables. Take a number. So in order to, the, 
Well, really the entire point of triage is prioritization. Where do we need to focus? And where can we let things slide for a bit while we put out the most immediate fires? Triage with FAIR gives you a, a really easy way to elevate those by a number of different vectors. So if you're just looking at basic risk ranges and you wanna say what's our biggest, most crazy risk range that's up there in the millions of dollars and is happening all the time, that's triage is gonna make it really easy to elevate those right up to the top so that you can deal with them immediately. Yeah, and there's, as you get into the analysis, people tend to get, find reasons why it shouldn't work. They find it, part of the being overwhelmed is their objections to it. And so we called it known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Well, and, we, we stole it a little bit from, from the DOD, but <laughs> I don't need to know that. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing is, you know, I, I, I'm making my dad joke here, which is you are unique, just like everybody else. And what that means is almost anything you want to measure has probably been measured before. And like we talked about with regard to the loss tables, you have more data that's accessible to you than you think in terms of your subject matter experts, business matter experts. There's a lot of places you can find this data. It's likely there. And lastly, Bayesian, just because it's a really cool word, but it means you need less data than you think. We tend to want to create that perfect model. We want overwhelming amounts of data to support our analysis. And in reality, you may not need that much data I don't want to put you on the spot, Dave, but as far as pre-measured metrics, what are some good options for people to, to go out and find pre-measured metrics that have already been, been compiled and they're out there waiting to be used? Um, well, so let's say you're in a financial sector or you're doing a risk analysis on a vendor who's in the financial sector or a specific industry. You can actually Google that, and I know that's how everybody Googles everything, but you can actually look for evidence of how often a breach happens, for example, and in sampling that you might find 100 companies and out of that 20 have suffered a breach within a certain amount of time, that can actually be the start on your data. So it's not just the data within your company, you can find well-vetted sources of data to tell you um, things that you need to know to start your analysis. So I think there's something we need to talk about. Um, here's another great term, Dunning-Kruger. Alyssa, I think you've got some, you got some things to say about that. Dunning-Kruger is a fantastic and fascinating psychological concept wherein people often think that they know more than maybe they actually do, which very much conflicts with some of Dave's previous statements, but <laughs> it is in that <laughs> we, we become very confident in the facts that we think we know. And when confronted with opposing information, a lot of times our brains, without us even knowing about it, are going to double down on what we already know and reject that new information as false, even if it's real. So the Dunning-Kruger effect can be something that we really need to look out for when doing risk analyses and then talking with our SMEs. Because SMEs are smart, but they've never been very introspective, probably, about what they know and why they know it. So metacognition, that's a nice $10 word, um, about thinking about thoughts. Um, so getting your SMEs to think about their knowledge, why they know it, and challenging them through, through questioning, not through arguments or direct confrontation, but just questioning their knowledge, questioning what they tell you um, can, can really lead you to a sort of informational Buddhism in having that introspective data analysis that becomes very defensible because you're asking them to defend, you're asking a SME who is a subject matter expert to defend bend their expertise and provide reasoning for the numbers that they're giving them. 
And so the last thing to talk about with data gathering is knowing when enough is enough. Um, I hinted at that a little bit ago, but make sure you don't get bogged down in the data gathering thinking you have to gather more and more and more because there's a point when more really is less and this is triage remember this is rapid response and so you don't want to spend weeks doing that you do want this to be a responsive and relatively short process risk isn't managed in a vacuum certainly not in my vacuum <laughs> So when we're talking to business people, especially when they're not at all familiar with IT or risk management, we really need to bring things down to their level. Yes, everybody who's, who's watching this is likely very smart. And I know we all like showing that off through using big words, but these people need to, it, it needs to be a relatable conversation between, between peers. Um, bringing that down to their level and helping them understand what you're asking of them is going to make every interaction a whole lot easier than if you're you're spitting questions at them and using highly technical language. You want them to feel comfortable with you. You don't want them to feel like they're under a microscope or going through an audit. And when we start to talk to the business, this becomes even more critical because in my experience, I found when I started talking to the business, I wasn't talking the same language at all, sometimes using the same words, or I was using words that they didn't really get the definition for. So for example, um, in a business value mapping, I said, well, tell me your top five business processes by revenue. And I got some blank stares. And I had to rephrase it to say, what, are, what is the work every day that people do to, that make your department work? And can we group those tasks together? And once I started talking about it like that, they really understood it. And so you have to establish a rapport. Some part of this isn't, like, like Alyssa said, it's not an audit. We're gathering information to help the, the business make decisions. And in doing that, we have to talk to them in their terms. And so this is a, a great upside for doing this is you, you do establish rapport with um, key people within the business and it does open some doors for you even if your meetings on zoom so calibrate this so like we said you already have enough data it needs to be unlocked you have to go find it and so chances are everything you need already exists in the company you just need to go and find it So what are some things to look for, Alyssa? What are, what are we looking for? What are some problems with this? No problems with it. I mean, absolutely, there is a lot of data out there to, that can be pre-consumed, but ultimately you're gonna have to talk to people. And when you talk to business people, when you talk to people in IT, you're gonna wanna strive for calibrated estimates, which is that, that starting at ridiculous ranges, both on the low end and the high end, and slowly narrowing your ranges until you get to a point that you're about 90% confident. Uh, one thing that you need to be careful of, especially when you're talking with technical people, uh, can be anchoring. And that is where they'll, they'll throw out a most likely number. Let's say uh, a data breach happens once every three years. Um, on average, the lowest we'll ever see it is once a year, or the lowest we'll ever see it is once every six years, and the highest we'll ever see it is three times every three years. It's just an average of ultimately your, your most likely number, and you don't want to let them do that. So the, the easiest way that I found to really drive those discussions is to start with low ranges and, and maybe even set a range around your lowest, your lowest number and your highest number, and then start narrowing those ranges down and then start narrowing down into the most likely range. Um, something else though to keep in mind is uh, diminishing returns. And that is the, the entire point of accuracy versus precision. This does not need to be 100% correct. 
Um, it's a defensible process that gets you to a range and triage is there to help you get to that range very quickly. Um, a lot of the prep work that goes into that definitely helps with driving that triage value and getting those triage analyses done very quickly. And it, it can be difficult, you know, to get your subject matter experts or the people you're talking to into that established range with some confidence. We're, we need this to be calibrated. So there's some techniques, and these are well-known techniques, and gamification is one of the best. Um, this could be pretty simple. You could just have 10 cards, nine of one color, one of another color, shuffle them, and or use a bag with 10 marbles, and nine of which are the same color, one of which isn't. And you can see that there's a 90%, 10% ratio there. And we want to reach that calibrated estimate. And it's been proven that if you put the, this exercise to them in terms of money to say, all right, if you could pick between sticking with your estimate or picking a marble out of this bag, which one are you going to pick? And at the point where they're going to stick with their estimate, based on the probabilities of the objects in your bag or your cards or whatever you're using to gamify it, you've reached a pretty high fidelity in the calibration of those estimates. One other thing to consider, and this is less in talking to SMEs, but something to have in mind while you are talking to SMEs is knowing your controls landscape and your resistance strength. Um, if you're talking to an application SME or networking SME, they're going to understand the controls around those specific things but you're measuring vulnerability on a larger scale than that. So make sure that you understand the enterprise control landscape and what maybe is upstream or downstream from the specific scenario that you're looking at. Yeah, and we've found you know, in the past that you know, initially having a workshop, for example, yeah. with SMEs from multiple areas where you're kind of simulating it, walking through it, and then you find out somebody knows about controls that somebody else doesn't know about. So it's a great way to, to kind of get those estimates and uh, arrive at calibrated estimates. All right, nice assets. It'd be a shame if something bad happened to them. Um, so building an asset library, and this is another key to the rapid triage process and also making it effective and the really good news is that in version three, RiskLens added some great capabilities for doing that. You can create assets as reusable components where their vulnerability and resistance strength, uh, they're, they're already pre-calculated for you. Well, you calculate them in the asset and then anytime you use the asset in a scenario, all of that information is already brought over. So if you're running triage and you pull an asset that you already have built out, that's going to give you a really accurate assessment in a really short amount of time. Doing that across multiple assets is going to get you, you know, that, that sort of long range risk register view of we have these assets, these are the risks, this is maybe the riskiest asset. And some people that are going to say, well, that means we have to spend a whole bunch of time creating the assets, an asset library. And if you've ever worked on a CMDB project, you know, that can be a road, the bridge to nowhere sometimes. But in version three of Risk Lens, we can now create assets when we need them. So you're not limited by needing to go out and find, classify, document tons of those assets. You can now create them during your risk scenarios. And, and that's an awesome new feature. Yeah, essentially, triage is going to populate risk statements in your risk register and allow you to sort through those dynamically by risk type or by threat type or by asset or by range. So you've got, a, in a way, a, a multi-dimensional view of your risk that can be dynamically sorted to to target whatever population or whatever specific scenario or use case that, that you are currently engaged in. And it removes the guesswork from flagging your top risks. And now you're gonna have uh, business relevant risks for your business stakeholders. And 
one of the things that will happen is you're going to uncover outliers. You're going to find some risks that are just almost breathtaking. It's like driving up to the Grand Canyon. You don't want to get too close to the edge because you might fall in. And those scenarios are really interesting, but the problem can be that they cause concern among the executives. They may question your analysis, for example. And it's really critical to point out that risk analysis is an iterative process. You do need, do need to go back and make sure that the results you have are actually reasonable. It's pretty easy to make a mistake or misestimate. Um, and the, the good news is it's pretty simple to go out and find them. But keep in mind that this is an iterative process. It's not a one-time event. And if you do have an outlier, um, if your executives take issue with the, or anyone who takes issue with the, the potential range that's being shown, it's very easy in risk lens to walk them through exactly what the, the workshop was and make changes where you need to. And, and you have that, that sort of history view as well now in version three that you can see how that risk changes depending on what your inputs are. Yeah, I, I remember years ago, I, I created a qualitative risk analysis and somebody actually asked, well, why is this up here and why is it red? I said, well, because that's where I put it. And guess what? That's not really the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> this will make sure you never have to just say, well, that's where I put it. <laughs> <laughs> I threw a dart. Um, is that okay? It's a probabilistic model. Um, so let's go let's come down to outcomes because at the beginning we talked about needing outcomes and you'll see in the graphic and Alyssa is going to talk about this a little bit, but you can absolutely perform quantitative analysis using spreadsheets. You can do it. Um, but what's going to be missing is the ability to reuse data. We talked about, you know, the assets and data helpers and um, the ability to create an iterative process in which each iteration actually builds the speed at which you're going to be able to approach your next risk scenario. So another problem with the spreadsheet method is it just doesn't scale well for large and distributed teams. And right now, as we speak, of course, there's a lot of people working from home. And so almost all teams are distributed in some way. And what I really like is that Risk Lens has some great tools in the form of those assets and data helpers. Yeah, this really makes it a very quick and easy process. A lot of people will say that quantitative analysis can't work because it takes too much time. It, you can't ever deliver business relevant results in the time that they are still relevant. But using these reusable data points and relying on a lot of that pre-planning with your assets with your assets, with your loss tables, um, with, your, with your business executives, with your SMEs, your technical SMEs, they're going to give you these data points that allow you to run quick scenarios in triage that will provide a lot of accuracy. And then you can definitely do a deep dive into any of these scenarios that you triage. Uh, it makes it easier for you to to decide where those deep dives need to be done so that executive leadership isn't just swerving towards risk acceptance rather than risk mitigation because you can plan for this and show the business value in mitigating these risks. And when you're building this analysis, you know, now you're expressing risk in dollars and you're giving the business information to make decisions that aren't just a jerk of the wheel, right? We're not just going to yank the wheel to go to risk acceptance and move on. And your risk triage and quantitative analysis are going to help your business people make quick decisions that drive down risk. And this can and should contribute to your top line operations. Now, one of the common arguments against quantitative analysis is that it isn't responsive. And what we outlined here are ways to make it responsive um, by engaging with the business, by building those asset libraries, by building the muscle memory in your department and throughout the organization. And the triage process is the biggest step in demonstrating both the value and the relevance of risk. So I want to thank everybody who tuned in. Alyssa, I really appreciate you taking part. And uh, so I, I, I really 
appreciate you know Risk Lens having us here and the Fair Institute. So I want to make sure to invite everybody to ask questions, uh, and we'll be here for a little bit to to make sure we answer them.